How are you? Are you good? Every day in Malibu is a good day, isn't it? Driving up to 405, I say, you know how it's got its name, don't you? You're on it for four or five hours. And uh, I, it is a really an honor to be. I have looked forward to this. Mike, Mike actually invited me two years ago, I think, that I've had this on the calendar. And I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And I walked into this room today. I thought, deja vu. I've been here before. And last year, uh, Rick and Agnes Gibson invited us down here to come see Les Miserables that the Pepperdine put on. And it was moving, unbelievable, entertaining, exciting, tears, laughter, and I guarantee you, you're not going to get any of that today, okay? <laughs> so, uh, greetings from Eastside Christian Church in Anaheim, home of the Ducks, the Angels, Mickey Mouse, and the most, exp I mean, happiest place on earth. <laughs> and uh, I, I know uh, most of you, you've, you know, I'm, I'm new to you, and you're new to me, and, and you've never heard me speak before. And some of you are wondering right now, like, Gene, is that your real voice? Do you really sound that way? And, you know, I'd give your audio team 100 bucks if they could make me sound like Barry White today, you know, kind of, Jesus loves you, baby, something like that. Uh, but instead, when God was handing out voices, I got one that sounds like I've been inhaling helium for four days. And so that's kind of what you're stuck with today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, a number of years ago, 1968, when uh, Bobby Kennedy was furiously fighting for the Democratic nomination for uh, president, he spent one unusually hot, humid spring day crisscrossing New York City and uh, the neighborhood of Spanish Harlem. And at the end of five hours going back and forth, his guide looked at him, and he was soaked in perspiration, caked in dust. And his guide said, uh, why do you do this? Why do, why do you come to a place like this? You know, you, an affluent guy from an affluent family, why would you do this? And he said, because I found out something I never knew before. I found out that my world was not the real world. I found out that my world was not the real world. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, small town, conservative, Christian church, preacher's home. And uh, in 1985, uh, I moved to Las Vegas. You know, in the years that uh, I was growing up in the, in the home that I grew up in, uh, I never really had to deal with people who were different than me, because in the little town that I grew up in, there weren't people who were different than me. But then in 1985, I moved to Las Vegas. And uh, to a church there. I become the pastor of a church there. Now, Las Vegas church, I know, sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, people always wonder, you know, what's church like in Las Vegas? Do you have uh, Elvis impersonators doing the prelude? You know, girls in bikinis announcing hymn numbers? You know, kind of <laughs> tithe machines in the lobby? You know, what, what, what is that like? But it was quite an experience for me. And here's what I found out during my 18 years of living in Las Vegas and has only been confirmed to me after five years in Chicago and six and a half years now in Southern California, is that the world I grew up in was not the real world. Maybe, maybe just a small slice of the real world would maybe be more accurate to say. Because in the town I grew up in, I didn't have to confront my feelings about people who were different than me. I didn't have to confront my feelings about people who were different ethnically than me, people different socially than me, people different politically than me, economically than me, spiritually than me, because I really didn't know people uh, who were different than me. I didn't have to confront my feelings about racial issues because I didn't really have any significant relationships with people of another race. I didn't have to confront my feelings about people who followed other major world religions because I didn't know people who followed other major world religions. I didn't have to confront my feelings toward gay and lesbian people because I didn't know any gay and lesbian people. At least, I didn't think that I did. But of course I did. It just wasn't safe for them to come out in my little town. I had always assumed that, uh, like, LGBT people were out there somewhere and, uh, when I moved to Las Vegas, I found out they were out there in Las Vegas. And for the first time in my life, I had to deal with my feelings for people who were different than me on a personal level. 
Within my first week of living in Las Vegas, God gave me the opportunity to minister to a gay man. And those years in Las Vegas were so good for me because they forced me to wrestle with what Jesus really meant when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And that wrestling with that redefined my life a bit and certainly redefined ministry for me. That was a lot easier to do in my own town, to love my neighbor as myself, because my neighbors were a lot like me. But in Vegas, that became a new challenge for me, because Jesus didn't put any qualifiers on that statement. Jesus didn't say, love your neighbor if he dresses like you, if she believes like you, if he or she uh, never cheats on their spouse, or if they live a lifestyle like yours. He just said, love your neighbors as yourself, period. No asterisk, no prerequisite, no presupposition. No qualifier, just love your neighbor, whether they're gay or straight, whether they believe in God or don't believe in God or they're really not sure, whether they're a Republican or Democrat, whether they're a Tea Party member or they just like to party, whether they're an Oakland Raider fan or they don't even own a gun. You just, <laughs> no, just a little fun with my Oakland Raider fans in the crowd. Jesus just said, whoever they are, even if they are different than you, uh, treat them with love. Now, I'll be honest with you, I really prayed and wrestled with what direction to go with our time together today. I, I asked Mike, I said, Mike, do you want a Bible sermon for preachers? Do you want a leadership talk for church ministers and leaders? And, and he said, I, I think I'd kind of like you to do the latter. But after praying about it, I kind of felt led to do neither. And uh, I want to share with you some words today that probably more than anything else are confessional in nature. Uh, I, I want to take a deeper look at a person in the Bible that we're all familiar with. And this is a person who, just on a personal level, forces me to deal with my own moral, ethnic, political, generational and religious pride that sometimes keeps me distant from people who are different than me. You see, I spend a lot more time in my life than I would like to admit with a plank in my eye. I can be so much like one of those people that Jesus talked about that, you know, looks for the little speck in the eye of someone else while I'm walking around with a big log. Uh, in my own eye. I deal with issues of pride and prejudice in my life every day, issues that create a distance between me and others. And that's why I get so challenged, I get so convicted, I get so inspired by an event that's recorded for us in Acts chapter 10, and you've all taught from that chapter, where we see a side of the Apostle Peter that we're not used to seeing, that we're not comfortable of seeing. In fact, if you have a Bible or text on your smartphone, you want to turn to Acts 10, you can do that. You know, even though Peter was handpicked by Jesus to be this uh, founding church leader, to be an apostle, even though Peter had been there when the words rolled off of Jesus' lips, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, all, all ethnic groups, everybody, even though Peter was the one who stood up on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and confidently proclaimed, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, even though all of that, Peter was a deeply prejudiced and self-righteous guy. And he had a plank in his eye that he used to build a wall between himself and people who were different from him. He was deeply prejudiced, of course, against anybody that wasn't a Jew. He was brought up in an atmosphere that led him to believe if you weren't Jewish, you weren't human. He was brought up in an atmosphere that if you accidentally brushed up against a, a non-Jew in public, you needed to immediately go home and wash off the contamination. Uh, you shouldn't help a Gentile woman at a time of childbirth because that would just be bringing another Gentile into the world. And never have a Gentile into your home or go into the home of a Gentile because that would defile you. Now think about this. In the first 10 years of church history, there is no record of anyone communicating the good news of amazing grace through Jesus Christ to a single Gentile. And that was comfortable for Peter. And that was safe for Peter. 
And maybe like me, some of you have this instinctive nature inside of you, like Peter had, that takes the planks that's in our eyes and we use it to build walls between us and people who are different than us. For some, it's the wall we build between people of a different skin color, whether they're black or Asian or Latino or Arab or Asian or Jew. For some, it's political liberals you can't tolerate. For some, it's political conservatives that make your blood boil. For some, it's the body pierced, tattooed, covered, I used to say young person, but now it's like, you know, in their 70s, who uh, dresses so differently than you. Maybe it's the graying senior citizen who just seems so slow and out of touch in a world of smartphones and social media. For some, it's the person of a different religious school of thought, whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or Mormonism or New Age kinds of beliefs or Judaism. For some, it's the person who's HIV infected. I'll never forget uh, attending a softball game at a local park with some friends. I'm sitting in the bleachers, kind of like you are in this room right here. And I couldn't help but eavesdrop on the conversation of the people in front of me and just listening to them. And don't look at me like you've never done that. So I, we've all done. So I'm sitting there listening. And basically, they're recounting their lifestyle the last few days. And this was their lifestyle. They're just talking openly about it. The last few days was it was get up, go to work, go someplace to party after work, find somebody to sleep with that night, go home, go to bed, get up, go party after work, go find somebody to sleep with that night, all that kind of thing, just over and over again. And I'm listening to that conversation, and do you know what I was feeling inside? My heart was not breaking. I wasn't thinking, oh, man, I feel so bad they don't know how much they matter to God and that they're just trying to fill the void in their life through this. I didn't find myself thinking, um, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. I found myself thinking, whoa. Thank God I'm not like them. And I leaned over to the friend who was with me at the game, and I said, you're not going to believe the conversation down here. And I started telling about, you know, what they were talking about and the thing going, you know, the life cycle they were going to. And here's what I said. You're guest speaker for, you know, Bible lectures here at Pepperdine. Here's what I said, word for word, Gene Apple. I said, they're a bunch of sleaze balls." And my friend looked at me and said, you know, Gene, every time I'm in a group like this, I think this is where Jesus would be. These are the people he'd be hanging out with. These are the people he would be loving. And I'm telling you, God, use those words to shoot like a dart from the Holy Spirit right into my soul. And I remember burying my face in my hands. And I just thought, Gene, what is the matter with you? You, you get to stand up every weekend and tell people how much they matter to God and the extent God has gone to to love them. And right now, you are not loving very well. You know, from time to time, we've all heard about a church leader who had to resign because of a moral failure. And that usually refers to a sexual sin or a financial sin of some kind. I've never heard of a church leader that had to resign because of a lack of love. Because for some reason, we don't equate a lack of love with a moral failure. In the average church, if it's discovered the ministers had an affair, I mean, there's scandal, there's gossip, it's a horrendous, difficult thing. But the truth is, Gene Apple can live next to his neighbors day after day, week after week, year after year, never do a loving thing for them, and there won't be any scandal in the church. There won't be any whispers or gossip about our minister's moral failure. Because I think most of us aren't haunted by a failure to love. But I'll tell you who is. God is. A few years before Barbara and I, my wife and I, left Las Vegas, we moved into a neighborhood that really forced us to deal with these internal attitudes inside of ourselves of dealing with people who are different than us. And we moved into this neighborhood, and we had the most eclectic group of neighbors living around us. We had a Mormon family that lived right behind us uh, across the wall. And then on this side over here was a Hindu family, and across the street was a Jewish family. And then right next door on this side of us was uh, just kind of your typical Las Vegas heathen family. 
Uh, he, he, there two Mercedes in the driveway. He was an attorney. She was a topless dancer in a Las Vegas show. And our kids played with their kids every day. Now, what are you going to do with that right there? Uh, what are you going to do with that? You see, something I've discovered over the years and something Peter had to discover is that while we have this instinctive nature to take the plank in our eyes and build walls with them, there is a universal need in this world for us to take these planks out of our eyes and instead of building walls that we build bridges with them. Remember in Acts 10 how uh, Peter encounters this guy who's not a Jew, uh, not a part of his ethnic group, not a part of his clique, not a, not a part of his upbringing named Cornelius. Cornelius, of course, is this military guy, led this regiment of soldiers. He's in this city called Caesarea uh, by the sea. And though he was not a follower of Jesus, though he didn't know Jesus about Jesus, he has this awareness of God. He prays to God. He, he gives money away to people who have uh, resource needs and compassion needs. And my guess is if Cornelius had died in that community, I mean, what an outstanding citizen. People would have said, oh, he was just such a good man. If anybody's in heaven today, it's Cornelius. That's probably what they would have said at his funeral. But Cornelius and his family were spiritually lost. I mean, if they weren't, think about it, there would be no need for this chapter to be in the Bible. There would be no need for God to ask Peter to go build a bridge to him. And the only thing sadder than the fact that Cornelius and his family was lost is that up to this point in church history, nobody even cared. Nobody even gave a rip about that. Peter certainly didn't because Cornelius wasn't like him. Cornelius wasn't one of his people. But one day, God gives Cornelius a vision. And he sees an angel of God, maybe it looked like Mike Trout or Albert Pujols or something, you know, who plays for the angels today. And, uh, and the angel instructs Cornelius to send some of his men uh, down to Joppa, to the home of Simon the Tanner, where they're going to find this guy named Peter. And so he does that. Now, Peter has no idea about the quipple, quadruple bypass surgery that God is about to do on his heart for people who are different from him. Because God is just so good at taking us away from things that we have resisted all of our lives and making us come face to face with them. So in our neighborhood, God brought us face to face with these people who were different than us. And we started to get to know them, especially we got close to this Jewish family who was across the street from us and the heathen family next door with the attorney and the topless dancer and our kids playing together every day. Their kids were in our house every day. Our kids were in their house every day. Uh, they would go on vacation. They'd ask us to get their newspaper and mail, you know, for them while they were gone. Let me tell you, there were some interesting subscriptions in that stack of mail. <laughs> We'd go to birthday parties for their kids and there were plenty of surgically enhanced people at those parties, I'm telling you right now. And you know what we discovered about our eclectic neighbors as we started to get to know them? We discovered we started to like them. They started mattering to us. In fact, we started to love them. And it was as if God was saying to us, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? I want you to be a bridge builder to them, not a wall builder. And I think that's what God was wondering about Peter. Do you get it? Do you get it? And, and I think he often wonders that about you and me. You know, sometimes I wear contact lenses. And a while back, every time I'd put my contact lenses in, I, I couldn't see very well. It was like worse. It was fuzzy and blurry. And I'd get up in church, couldn't read my Bible, couldn't read my sermon notes. And, and it was really bothersome and frustrating. And I didn't know what was going on. And I don't know what made me think of this, but one weekend before our services on Saturday night, I, the thought hit me, I wonder if somewhere along the line I've gotten my lenses switched, and the one that's supposed to go in my right eye and put in my left eye, and the one that's supposed to go in my left eye and put in my right eye, and so I thought, oh, what the heck, I'm, I'm just going to switch them around. And it was amazing how much better I could see when I did that. <laughs> I saw things with such new precision and new clarity, you know, and, and I've thought about that. And I thought about that's what often happens to us, you know, who love God, who follow God, who are part of his church, who are church leaders. We get our lenses switched. And instead of being outward focused, we get inward focused. Instead of being inclusive of people, we become very exclusive of others. We want it to all be about me my, me, my needs, my family, my wants. 
We lose sight of the fact that Jesus came on a search and rescue mission to seek and save the lost. There was a professor down at uh, Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, did a survey of a thousand churches and asked the people of those churches, what is the number one purpose of the church? 89% of the respondents said, the number one purpose of the church is to meet my needs and the needs of my family. It was saying, it's all about me. My wants, my preferences, my programs, my music. And so it really shouldn't be that much of a big surprise to us that 80% of all churches in the U.S., now just think about this for a minute, 80% of all churches are plateaued or declining. It shouldn't shock us that half of all churches in the U.S. last year didn't add one new member by conversion. And if that doesn't break your heart, maybe this will. This year in the U.S., 4,000 churches will sing their last song, pray their last prayer, and close their doors for the last time. The lens is switched. Now, while Cornelius' guys are en route to get Peter, Peter goes up on the roof, and you remember that. He's hungry, and he's tired, and he goes into this dreamlike trans thing, and, and he, he sees this big sheet like a parachute coming down from heaven with all kinds of food items on it that a good kosher Jew would, would never eat. And then Peter hears a voice say, uh, Get up, Peter, kill it and eat. Go ahead, have that ham sandwich, you know. Enjoy bacon with your eggs in the morning. Have a pork chop for dinner. You just go ahead, kill and eat. And that must have been like fingernails on the chalkboard to Peter, you know, just like, oh, no way. He was very proud of his diet. He had followed a long list of dietary restrictions his whole life. He was a rule keeper. And so in this vision, God puts all kinds of forbidden animals on the sheet, and he says, kill and eat. And breaking out of that comfort zone, that would be painful for Peter. In fact, I love his response in verse 14 of this chapter. He says, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Nice move, Peter. Just tell God what to do. And can't you hear the self-righteous pride in his voice? Oh, I've never eaten anything like that. No, I would never do that. I think about how many times I do that in my own life. Well, I've never done that. Well, I've never done what he's done. I've never, I'm not that bad. He just didn't get it. That God was into tearing down walls and building bridges. And so God gives him the vision the second time to see if he gets it. And, and then God gives him the vision a third time. And then the text says in verse 19 and 20, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. And as Peter's heading downstairs, I'll bet he's thinking, Oh, no, they're going to be Gentiles. I just know they're going to be Gentiles. Because God is just so good at taking those things we've resisted all of our lives, and he brings us face to face with them. And so Peter goes down, and he learns that these guys at the door have been sent by this, you know, Roman soldier named Cornelius. And Peter does something unheard of in that day, and I don't think we can even begin to appreciate the magnitude of it. He invites those guys on the other side of the wall, these guys who are different than him, to enter this home, to be the guest there. Now think about that. Jewish neighborhood. Can't you see the reaction of the neighbors next door? You know, he's out washing his chariot or something. His wife's planting her flowers, and he's like, did you see who just went in, in the house next door? Pretty soon they're all going to be moving in here going to be everywhere. Peter had carried this plank in his eye for too long, and it was blinding him as to how much these people mattered to God and the extent God had gone to to build a bridge to them. When my wife Barbara and I got married, I had this uh, antique children's bank that I had had since I was a little kid. A family friend had given it to us, and it was just about this big. It was cast iron, and it had a little man in it who ha had his hand out, and you'd put like a nickel or a penny or a dime in his hand, and you'd pull a lever, and he would deposit the, the coin into the bank. And it was kind of beat up. The paint was kind of brushed off a little bit. It had been cracked. But I'd, I had it displayed prominently on a shelf in my bedroom 
for many, many years. And after we got married, I intended to continue to display it prominently in my bedroom for many years. But Barbara had other interior design ideas. And she thought that old bank might look like better in a closet or something like that. Or, or maybe better yet, maybe if we just sold it at a garage sale because, you know, it's just a piece of junk. Who would want that old thing? And I said to her, honey, I said, this is an antique. I, I think it's more valuable than you think it is. And she would say, oh, you know, you'd be lucky to get $5 for it at a garage sale and you, you ought to feel guilty about that. But I said, honey, you know, people collect this stuff. It might be worth a significant amount to somebody. So one day I convinced her to take it to an antique shop. And she goes in, and, and uh, she has this bank, and she says, uh, my husband has this bank that he insists is worth something. I wonder what you might give it, give us for it. And so the collector looks it over, and he says, uh, I'll give you $120 for it. Now, do you think my wife is going to take $120 for this bank that she would have been willing to give away, you know, a week earlier? Not on your life. She calls me. She's all excited. She says, guess what? Guess what? I said, what? She goes, our bank might be worth a lot more than we thought it was. <laughs> yeah, now it's our bank, right? And uh, so this was, this, was, this was like in the early 90s before the internet. And so we went to the library and we got these collector magazines and we started finding people who collect this stuff. And we contacted a collector in Washington, D.C. and he asked us to overnight some pictures of the bank to him. So we did. And he immediately called us and offered us $2,000 for this bank. Now, do you think my wife is going to take $2,000 for this bank? Not on your life. Uh, to make a long story short, we eventually sold that bank to a collector in uh, Pennsylvania for $4,000. Aren't you happy for us? The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All of a sudden, we were looking through all our closets going, what other junk do we have in here that uh, we, we, we could get rid of? Uh, that true story, uh, I, I recently went online and I saw the identical bank to my, to my bank. It's called a Picture Gallery Bank. Had recently sold, a uh, collector had bought for $52,000. <laughs> so you can see how brilliant we really were uh, in, in that transaction. Now, I told you that story to remind you something. We all know this. Value is determined by what somebody is willing to pay for something. The value of that bank was not determined by what it was worth to Barbara. It was determined by what a collector would pay for it. Value of your house doesn't even really matter what it appraises for. The value is determined by what somebody's willing to pay for your house. Here's the value of all people. Every single human being ever who walked this planet, no matter who they are. Just listen to this. 1 Corinthians 6.20. For God bought you with a high price. God bought you with a high price. You know, with a plank in our eye, we can look at other people and we think they're not even garage sale material. God looks at them and says, I'll give the life of my only son for them. I'll give my son to be pierced for your transgressions, to be crushed for your iniquities. By his wounds, you'll be healed. That's how valuable God says you are. I will build a costly bridge to you. You see, bridges tend to be enormously expensive and tremendously difficult to build. So the next day, Peter travels back to Caesarea with these soldiers from Cornelius. And I wonder what he was thinking as he traveled with these guys. I mean, think about this. He hadn't spent time with people who were not like him. And I wonder if he wasn't thinking, hey, these guys aren't so bad. They're kind of normal like me. We have some things in common. They're interesting to talk to. I've been missing out on this all my life. And when they arrive at the house of Cornelius, Cornelius has, you know, some relatives and friends and family all gathered there. And, and Corn Peter is faced with a defining decision. Is he going to cross the threshold and walk into the house of Cornelius? Because remember, no Jew would ever go into the home of a Gentile. They were wall builders. Once he stepped through that doorway, everything would change. And so Peter is faced with one of the most costly bridges he's ever built. It'll cost him his pride. It'll cost him his self-righteousness. It'll cost him his prejudice. It will cost him his reputation in many circles. It will mean paying the price of change. 
There's a tough word in churches, right? Change is hard. Change is hard. Just try moving the piano somewhere, you know? Change is hard. Oh, you don't have a piano, do you? Yeah, so good. God bless you. That would really be hard, wouldn't it? Yeah, see, so we're moving one in. No, I forgot who I was speaking to for a moment. You're gracious. Thank you. My wife, Barbara, and I, uh, we got married 22 years ago last January, and from the day we got married, my life changed. Uh, and Barbara initiated several non-sanctioned changes in my life. They were non-pre-approved. She changed my soap. I had always been a gold dial soap guy. Now, that's a great soap, isn't it? I mean, that's a manly soap. That's a deodorant soap. But she changed my soap. And I'd like to be able to say, you know, I was cool. I said, great, it's wonderful. Thanks for changing my soap. But I griped. I complained. I whined about it. And uh, I'm embarrassed to admit this with so many guys in the room today. But for the last 22 years, my soap has been caress. <laughs> but my skin is silky smooth. So change can be a hard thing, but change can be a really good thing, right? Fully aware of the price that he would pay and how hard it would be, Peter walks through the door. What a moment. And he finds himself in a situation, just look around this room right now or look around a lot of our churches. He finds himself in the situation, a lot of our Latino and Asian and African-American brothers and sisters find themselves here right now for the first time in his life. He's the minority. Verse 25 of this chapter says, As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Now think about Peter could have really played that up, right? Yes, yes, bless you, my son. Kiss the ring of the Reverend Dr. Apostle Pastor Peter here. <laughs> as I power up over you. But to his credit, he didn't do that. Verse 26, Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man like you. I like that. I'm just a guy like you. I'm just struggling. I'm just growing like you. I don't have it all together. Reminds me of something Tony Evans, the great African-American pastor in Dallas, said one time. This is great. He said, no matter what ship we came over on, we're all in the same boat now. And it's as if Peter is recognizing, hey, Cornelius, you and I, we're in the same boat. We're both sinners in need of God's grace. And you know the fantastic conversation that takes place in that chapter. Cornelius shares with Peter all about this vision that he had from God and the instructions to send for him. And then the lights go on for Peter. Verses 34 and 35. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize that it is true that God, hear this, God treats everyone on the same basis. Whoever fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him no matter what race he belongs to. So let me ask you in your soul, have you come to that realization yet in your life that God treats everyone on the same basis. Do you treat everyone on the same basis? No matter what group, political party, sexual orientation, race, lifestyle he or she belongs to? Peter goes on and shares with these people the amazing grace of Jesus Christ, people he wouldn't have eaten, even eaten with a few days earlier, about this bridge that Jesus has built to cross this chasm that had divided us from God. What an, an amazing thing started to happen. They started to believe the message. They started, you know, putting their faith in Jesus. And God's power, God the Holy Spirit shows up. They start speaking in languages they hadn't heard. Peter looks at that. He thinks back to the day of Pentecost. Wow, this is the same experience we had in Acts chapter 2. And, 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 and he says in verses 47 and 48, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. Now listen to this next phrase. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So first of all, this is the first Gentile baptism service ever. There had never been a Gentile baptism before that we know of. And then they asked Peter to stay a few extra days with them. What an experience that must have been for the first time in his life. You know, he eats a ham sandwich and shrimp cocktail and sweet pickles and 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 all of this is going on. Now, 
why go through all this whole story that we're all familiar with today? Because here's my take on this story. I think there are actually two conversions going on in this story. First, there's the conversion of Cornelius and his family. And second, and I think maybe the bigger conversion, is the conversion going on in Peter's heart for people who are different than him in honor of the God who had built a bridge to him. So strangely, as Barbara and I get to know these neighbors who are different than us, the conversion started taking place inside of us. And we found ourselves loving them, and we found ourselves with a renewed awareness of what spiritually is hanging in the balance for them. And so we just started praying every day, God, you know, use us somehow to plant seeds, water seeds, bring the increase in your time. You know, we, we want our neighbors to come to know the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. And given just how far they were from God, we thought... <laughs> You know, it's probably going to be five years before we get them in a church for the first time. But, but we were going to pray. But a little over a year after being their neighbor, we'd only lived in the neighborhood for about a year. 9-11 happened. Y'all remember the Sunday after 9-11? Everybody was in church Sunday after 9 There were no ball games. There were no sporting events. There were no airplanes. There was nothing else people could do, so they all went to church. And so after our 9 o'clock services, we're in Las Vegas at the time, after our 9 o'clock services, uh, I'm up to my office kind of regrouping, getting ready for the next service, and my wife Barbara walks in, and she's in tears. And she says, you'll never guess who I just sat with. And I said, who? And she said, the names of our heathen neighbors, the lawyer and the topless dancer. And I said, What? <laughs> And she said, yeah, I was just walking into the building, and, and we happened to walk in at the same time, and we, we hadn't connected with them for a few days, and, and what we didn't know was the best man in their wedding had been killed in the collapse of one of the World Trade Center towers in New York City. And they were grieving, and they were hurting, and they didn't really have a church, and, but we were the only church they knew of, and so they showed up. So Barbara sits with them in church, and there was one point in the service, there a lot of people in, uh, in Las Vegas have East Coast connections, and I said, if you know someone who was killed this week in Washington and Pennsylvania and New York, would you just stand today? We want to pray for you today. And surprisingly, quite a number of people stood. And I said, now, if somebody's standing near you, would you just put your hand out on them, and let, let's pray for them. And so Barbara's reaching out with her hands on my heathen neighbors, praying for them, tears are just coming down their face. I couldn't believe it. So I go to the 11 o'clock service that day, and after the service, I'm, I'm just walking down the hallway trying to touch and pastor and encourage as many people as I can. It was such a traumatic time in the life of our nation. All of a sudden, I look, and I see my Jewish neighbor coming right down, down the hall at me, and her name's Stacy, and she comes up, and she gives me this great big bear hug, and she's got tears in her eyes, and she says, Oh, Gene. You have no idea what being here today has meant to me. God used that tragedy in both of their lives to be a turning point of great spiritual progress. When we left Las Vegas, we had so many difficult goodbyes. My wife had lived there all of her life. I was there for 18 years. We were leaving our oldest son who was in college there. We had a church family that loved us. We had so many difficult goodbyes. But the thing that really took us by surprise is that our most difficult goodbyes were to these neighbors that we used to think we didn't have anything in common with. Six and a half years ago, I moved to Orange County, Eastside Christian Church, a church that honestly had been on a slow decline for over a decade, had lost about a third of its congregation, was aging, had become ingrown, had kind of gotten its lenses switched, and it happens. You know, churches go through cycles that that happens. 
And I'm going to share with you something right now. I hope it doesn't discourage you. I hope it inspires you. During my first year in that church, we had 56 baptisms, and that was awesome. That was exciting. But this last year, we had over 700 baptisms. And often church leaders, uh, yeah, you can clap for that. That's, that doesn't deserve a golf clap. I think heaven did a little better than that on the applause on that one, probably. Uh, and church leaders often ask me this question. They'll say, Gene, how does that, how does that happen? How, how do those trends change? How, how, what is going on there? And it didn't happen without change. It didn't happen without vision. It didn't happen without changed structures. It didn't happen without changed programs. It didn't happen without changed musical styles. It didn't happen without changed communication techniques. But I'll tell you something. I'm convinced one change at the heart of it all, just to be honest with you, it would be those neighbors in Vegas who changed my heart and soul for people who are far from God, for people who are different than me. I hope that's made me into a different kind of follower of Jesus. I hope that's made me into a different kind of church leader. I've discovered that when you personally start building bridges like with people who are outside of your comfort zone and you decide to really, you know, love your neighbors, as Jesus said, not, you know, probably would be embarrassed if we asked how many of you don't know who lives three doors down from you. But Jesus said, love your neighbors. I have found that, that when, when you do that, it affects how you love. It affects how you pray. It affects how you lead a church. It affects how you preach. It affects how you give. It affects everything. Friends, God's dream for his church has always been that it would be a bridge-building kind of community where in honor of his son who died on a plank and built a bridge to us, we would take the plank out of our eyes and use it to build bridges to other people. So could I ask you to wrestle with a question that I've had to wrestle with in my life, uh, to be honest with you, more than I wish I had to wrestle with. The question is, what is the plank in your eye right now? Who are you labeling? Who have you slam dunked? Who have you given up on? Who have you just written off? Who do you secretly kind of kind of have a spiritual pride that you lord over a little bit? Who have you secretly condemned? What's the plank in your eye? Do you have it in mind? Can you name it? Can you call it for what it is? There's no other way to say it. Uh, when we have a wall-building mentality, when we make demeaning comments about people, you know, against people, that's sin. That's wrong. That doesn't mean you can't have sincere disagreements. That doesn't mean that you can't stand for truth in conversations. But we are to speak the truth in love. It just means it's wrong to demean them. Because when we demean another human being, we are demeaning someone who is made in the very image of God. We're demeaning the God in whose image they are made. And I had this crazy dream that maybe today could be a day where some of us confess and acknowledge that, that plank in our eye. Because here's what I know, if change is going to happen in our churches, it has to begin in me. It has to begin in you. Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. No one. Maybe your struggles with a particular group of people of some kind, those who belong to a certain political party, certain religious group, certain ethnic group, different sexuality than yours. Maybe it's a particular person that comes to mind, and you, oh, you, when you think of them, it is so hard to love. And yet that's someone that God couldn't bear the thought of spending eternity without. And so he gave his only son to build a bridge for them. You wouldn't give them the time of day. God gave his only son for them. So my fear is like, 
after a talk like today or even a week like you're going to have in the next few days is that you could sit here and say, yep, that's wrong. That's sin. But then we leave without ever taking the plank out of our eye or making a commitment to start building bridges. And so just imagine, what if, what if? What if at the start of this week, we just took a moment and said, God, I'm naming that for what it is. That's sin. And I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to take the plank out of my eye. Let's bow our heads together. So you can blow off these next few moments while we pray. And you could say, well, this is outside of my comfort zone or this didn't get to me or this doesn't convict me. Or you could just open yourself to the activity of God in your life right now. And this could be a moment of confession and repentance and even forgiveness that changes you, that changes you, your attitude, your spirit. And when it changes you, it could change the churches and ministries that we serve. And when it changes the churches and the ministries that we serve, it can change the communities that we impact. I can't help but imagine what God could do, the thousands of people that could experience his amazing grace. If we really got this right in our hearts and our minds. Well, God, my prayer is very simple today. Uh, have mercy on me, the sinner. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that we could all, in honor of the one who died on a plank for us, that we could take the plank out of our eye and be bridge builders to honor this one who died on a bloodstained cross and rose from an empty tomb. And I ask it for Christ's sake, and in his name, amen.